Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the second session this afternoon. My name is Mark Davison. I'm from Blue Sphere Health. We're a consultancy company working on uh, traceability and serialization, amongst a couple of other things as well. And this afternoon, for this next hour or so, we're going to look at serialization, uh, which has become a little bit of a buzzword in the industry uh, the last couple of years or so. And I, th I suppose just by show of hands initially, is there anybody in the room who has absolutely no idea what I just said? Uh, for whom serialization is a complete blank page. Um, so in that case, we're going to dive straight in at the deep end as deep as we can. No, we won't. Um, so my background is in the pharma space uh, initially, and I've also worked for service providers uh, selling back into the pharma space. So hopefully I can give you a, a perspective on some of these solutions as well as some of the questions in this space. And three things I'd encourage you for this session. Uh, the first one is to think of this as executive education, not a conference. So it would cost you thousands of euros to get these guys in the room to answer the questions that you might have in this space. Um, many thousands in some of their <laughs> cases. So two things. If you have a question as we go through, please put your hand up. I'll try and notice you, and we'll do it as we go along. I'd like this to be interactive. Secondly, and perhaps more importantly, if you hear a piece of jargon or an acronym that you don't know, do some semaphore and we'll try and uh, explain it for you. This shouldn't be baffling. It's a technical area, but it certainly shouldn't be a difficult area. Um, what I'm going to do is just go along the panel from my side to the other side and get everybody to introduce themselves. They can do it better than I can. And just say uh, who they are, who they're with, and what their relationship to serialization is. And then we'll go back and look at what the subject is and how it breaks down. So Eric, maybe you can start. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Eric Heffler, uh, Vice President of Manufacturing Services within Resifarm, a CDMO company. And it was mentioned earlier today that the ideal size of a CDMO might be around the range of 500 million of sales. And actually, that's exactly where Resifarm is. So <laughs> we're the ideal CDMO company. Mm -hmm. Uh, in terms of serialization, uh, we are struggling with a lot of complexity in this area. As a CDMO, we have many different sites and many different customers. So the scope for us is 16 sites across Europe and more than 100 customers. And the perspectives from the customers uh, vary all the way from you have to do as we tell you to do, to the other extreme, which is we do not really care what you do, just fix the problem. And that's uh, one of the key challenges that we face as a CDMO. Previous to being with Resifarm, I was with Meda, a Swedish specialty pharma company that just got acquired by Mylan. And then I was on the other side of the table because Meda has a large range of CMOs working for them. So there we were discussing an implementation program with more than 70 different CMOs to carry out serialization. So also seeing the complexity from that side and realizing quite quickly that uh, it's not easy as, uh, as a customer to CMOs to, to get exactly what you want. Okay, Paul. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Paul Cruz. I work for Shire Pharmaceuticals. Um, I've been in the pharmaceutical industry now for just over 40 years, and I've been hearing about serialization for most of that time. I was at Wyatt Pharmaceuticals when the Italians came up with their ideas for serialization and for track and trace and aggregation, and we ended up with the infamous Bellini label. So we've seen many in uh, implementations or attempts to implement serialization and track and trace in different guises across the globe. Within Shire, my role is um, head of external packaging. Shire, uh, now due to our recent uh, merger, quite a, a sizable rare disease company. We've got 25 CMOs and seven internal packaging sites, and we have to apply to serialization now to almost three and a half thousand SKUs. So it'll be quite a challenge for us. We're dealing with CMOs such as Resi Farm and, and Eric's team and working proactively with them to develop serialization solutions and effective serialization solutions. Thank you. Neil. Uh, Neil Lawrence from GlaxoSmithKline. Um, I work on a dedicated unit that's looking at the global platform of serialization. 
um, within global manufacturing supply at GSK. Uh, my role on the team is I'm the external facing element, so I deal with the regulators, um, the governments, legislators, trade associations, so on and so forth. So my role is to bring in the, the how and the what um, to then the people who do the do, essentially, for the engineering perspective. Um, I've been with them for just over four years. Um, previously before that, I also used to work on the other side as well. I did six years at the Department of Health um, rolling out patient safety um, solutions using coding. So I've kind of been alive and that barcode man now for the best part of a decade. So <laughs> perhaps it's time to change role again. Um, the, the one thing that I would say is kind of an opening comment is um, to just reinforce what Mark said. If you have questions, this is the time to ask them. Um, it's, it's rare to get four, should we use the word expert? It's, it's rare to get four <laughs> experts um, together that you can ask questions on something as specific and niche as serialization. So I would advise you to ask. Thank you. So good, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Martin Fitzgerald. I'm here representing the European Healthcare Distribution Association. Maybe that needs a little bit of explanation. Uh, essentially, uh, my organization is a European association bringing together the national associations of pharmaceutical full-line wholesalers uh, from across Europe. Uh, we typically are purchasing pharmaceutical products from the pharmaceutical industry, keeping them in stock, and supplying uh, them to all retail pharmacies across Europe, in some cases to uh, healthcare institutions such as hospitals. Um, personally, I'm the Deputy Director General of the Association. Um, we have an, a role to play in serialization, not in terms of actually placing anything on the pack or loading anything into what we're probably going to discuss a little bit later, the European Harbour National Repository Systems, but we do have a critical role in uh, checking out some of the information or checking out the serial number uh, before it's handed over to patients in some cases where the patient is not obtaining the product either in a pharmacy or in another healthcare institution. Um, so we've been heavily involved in the establishment with our uh, stakeholder friends at the industry side and at the pharmacy side in building up a European medicines verification system. And now we're very much engaged at national level in trying to roll out those systems uh, into all EU member states ahead of the 2019 uh, deadline. So uh, I guess we're going to talk a little bit more about all of that later. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, let's just take a step back initially and just think about what serialization actually is. It's very simple. It's putting a unique identifier on every box that we make, which sounds like something we might have been doing for years now. Um, in fact, the resolution of today's supply chain in the pharmaceutical industry is the batch. So thousands of different items are functionally the same at the moment. After serialization, the instance will be the resolution unit. So every box will be uniquely identifiable in the supply chain. So that huge step change is both a challenge and an opportunity. And I sometimes think of it a bit like the Hubble telescope, that it's expensive and controversial during the planning phase. It will bring a step change in resolution. It probably won't work as expected first time round, but I think retrospectively we might see it as a revolutionary time in our industry. And you know, let's hope so anyway. Maybe if we can just take a Eurocentric view for the moment and think about the falsified medicines directive, which is one of the drivers for serialization in our part of the world. <coughs> Maybe Martin, if I can start with you, can you give us a quick outline of what the falsified medicines says uh, directive says in relation to serialization and maybe the, the headlines of what needs to be done to comply as a manufacturer? Uh, well, yes, I mean, it all goes back to 2011 when the European institutions uh, published uh, what we call the Falsified Medicines Directive, and that has put in place this whole train of what we've been really working on over the last number of years and co contributing to the number of grey hairs on our head. But essentially the directive, which is the, the big piece of legislation, instructed the European Commission uh, to set out a lot of technical, the technical characteristics for the so-called safety features, which includes the unique identifier, which must, of course, be placed on the outer packaging of all prescription products uh, in, in the European Union. Uh, it also set out the modalities for verification of those. So the responsibility lies at the first of the manufacturer to label the product, to load that information into what we call a European hub. That's something which has been developed at the, Euro at the European level. 
and that information would then be routed down or transmitted to the national uh, systems or national repository systems. And it's against those national systems which uh, pharmacies and wholesalers will be able to interact for the purposes of verification, to check the authenticity of the product and to check out the information once it's been dispensed to the product so that we're sure that no second product bearing the same information uh, would appear in, this, in the supply chain. Of course, it's all targeted at patient safety. And so this is what we will uh, see developing across the countries. It's mandated by law, by the Falsified Medicines Directive. The details have been set out in the delegated regulation. And as stakeholders, uh, wholesalers, research industry, generics industry, parallel traders and pharmacies have been uniquely given a mandate uh, to set up these systems. It's something very particular in European legislation, placing the responsibility, a, a serious responsibility for patient safety and for big changes across the supply chain into the hands of stakeholders which often do not see eye to eye when it comes to uh, supply chain issues. So it's something which uh, we have embraced at the European level. Uh, it's, under, it's underwritten by the European legislation and our jobs now will be really nationally is to, is to come together all stakeholders which have a need to interact with these systems uh, to develop them and that's going to be a very big challenge uh, but it's all underlined in the directive and we have a vision at the European level for the rollout of that supported by what we call a national blueprint system whereby a solution will be offered to the stakeholders, a technical solution uh, more or less in order to achieve that in terms of establishing these repository systems. But of course manufacturers will be responsible for, by, for putting the information on the pack, for adapting their packaging lines and so on. Pharmacies will be responsible for putting in place the right hardware, getting connected to the systems, the same with wholesalers, the same with parallel distributors. So there's a lot of individual supply chain responsibilities also ahead in a very, very short time period up until February 2019. So we have a lot of work uh, ahead uh, to do. So just to reiterate that deadline, I mean, that's effectively two years away and change. It, it's really mm -hmm. tight now. So anybody in the room with a manufacturing hat on who isn't started, then um, see one of us after the <laughs> lesson. Um, Neil, maybe we can just expand from Europe into the other big market segments of the world, which is the United States, and, and maybe just draw some parallels with the Drug Supply Chain Security Act and what's driving activity for manufacturers who need to sell product over there. Um, broadly similar, but maybe you can just tease it out a bit. The, the, the key difference is something that Mike has just mentioned in that the, the, EU, the EU system was largely put in the hands of the stakeholders to develop and build. So it's, it's been built by the five pillars of the, the, the pharma world. Um, the US system is very prescriptive in that it's um, the FDA wants us to do it in a certain way using a certain method and a certain standard. So the, the two different signs of the cut, and they both have advantages and disadvantages. Um, you would argue in EU that it's too much on us, and in the US you would say we don't have enough say in the outcome. So it's, it's you know, it goes around. Um, the, the key point of this is that it is on patient safety. It is on the ability to ensure that the product that we make at the start of the supply chain is the product that the patient receives at the end of the supply chain. And it's the model in between. However, there are three different versions of serialization that I'm not going to bore you with. But suffice to say, they get more complex and more expensive, to say the least, and longer to implement. Europe's slap bang in the middle, where you'd expect Europe to be. Uh, the US is on the more expensive and more complex end, as you'd probably expect, in that it's, it's full track and traceability with aggregation of goods. So every packaging level has to be aggregated to the packaging levels below it, so that when the goods get to the wholesale units, either in shipping containers, aeroplanes, boats, whichever, they only have one scan to ensure that they know all goods. Whereas in Europe, they have to scan every single pack because there's no aggregation within Europe. And that sounds kind of, so what, when you say it out loud, but when you're a wholesaler and you've got 10 million products going through your supply chain yearly, um, that's a lot of beeping. So aggregation is the way forward, and I would recommend other markets, if they did it in a timely and wise manner, to use the aggregated data and to aggregate the supply chain, because it's a better, more secure method of ensuring the right product gets to the right patient at the right time in the right dose. Um, the US are facing challenges, <laughs> not just in serialization. Um, mm. Let's not go there. Um, the, the main challenge in the US at the moment is they don't have a system. They, they can't agree whether they want to have everyone to have their own system 
and then interchange between the various systems in a mind-boggling complexity way, or to have one central system that someone will own, and then everybody will go through. And there are systems like that that exist, not just the European version, but there are, there's GDSN, there's, I'm sure if we rang SAP, they could build us something in an afternoon that would be able to do that. Um, it's just a case of, as we know very well, getting all the stakeholders in a room and getting them to agree on what's best for the US market. So can we just tease out that aggregation thing a little bit more? So aggregation isn't written down anywhere in the European legislation as being a requirement. But functionally, for manufacturers to get the most out of their supply chains and for downstream people to have an easier life, are we saying collectively that aggregation is almost de facto required or are we saying it's optional still? Um, maybe, Paul, you can take that too. I would say rather than optional, prefer preferred. While it doesn't delegate in the legislation that we should implement aggregation, it is mentioned quite often throughout the uh, directive itself. In fact, aggregation gets more mentioned in the final published directive than the other safety feature, which we forget about sometimes, which is tamper evidence. Right. So by virtue of the fact that it gets mentioned more often, while not um, being delegated to us to implement it, it, the best way I've heard it described recently, it implicitly infers that it's the right thing to do without clearly delegating to you that it's the correct thing to do. And given that the system has been turned over, as um, the guys have alluded to, to the five pillars to set up at national level, if you asked that those involved in the downstream, such as, as Martin's group, etc., is aggregation important to you? I'm sure he, he would say yes. Mm -hmm because it makes the whole area of warehouse management and material management much more effective. And I know from our own experience in dealing with some of our distribution partners and wholesalers, in dealing with our supplier relationship management group in the early days, the, when I was presenting out to them the needs and requirements of the Falsified Medicines Directive, they said, well, we're not going to impose on our distribution partners, the whole process of aggregation. This is legislated as an item level uh, system and we will operate it at the item level. And our wholesalers have said, our distribution partners have said, they're not going to implement the system. And that was a misinterpretation of what the wholesalers and the partners have said. Because what the wholesalers and partners meant in dealing with them was that they weren't going to implement an item level verification system that they required the product to be supplied with at the very minimum case level aggregation so that they could scan the shipper labels and understand if the requirement was there exactly what the contents were within that shipper and not having to break down sub supplies of products out on an item by item basis. So in the early days or in the early uh, I would say times, this has been around since 2011, a lot of people have sat back and waited to see would the act be finally ratified before they made movement. The act was ratified in February this year. As uh, Mark has indicated, we have to be compliant by February 2019. All of a sudden, because it's now a legal requirement on us, people are clarifying their situation. And the need for aggregation is now becoming more and more a standard request when we're setting up systems and when we're applying 2D matrix and relating them to the higher hierarchy levels within batch creation. So maybe just to, to bring home the aggregation, the difference between serialization and aggregation with serialization. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, one of the two manufacturing guys here, what is the functionally and, and financially the difference between a serialized line and a fully aggregated line in terms of what has to happen on the line and the amount of cash that you have to go cap in hand for. Okay. In, in a simple word, significant, but <laughs> yeah. I'll let Neil elaborate. So, the, the fundamental point of serialization is to put a number on a box. That's it. There's nothing mind boggling about that. What's mind boggling with serialization is that not certainly from a GSK perspective, none of our lines had the ability to do that. So all the lines required to be upgraded 
to be able to print the codes, to be able to record the codes, to scan the codes into a computer system that could then speak to a governmental system. Additional markets, and not all markets require aggregation. Some markets are quite happy just to have a code on a box rather than the full, you know, all singing, all dancing, Chinese, Turkish solution. The difference is that to achieve aggregation within the, the packaging method, you have to have case packers and you have to have palletizers. Because as you take uh, a pen and you put it into a box, you have to scan the box. And then as that box goes into a case, you have to then be able to scan the case. And as the case goes onto a pallet, you also have to then be able to scan the pallet. And all that data has to be aggregated within a system. Now to do that, and aggregators, uh, you know, palletizers and case packers are probably the size of a boxing ring. That's the easiest way to think of it. And can cost anywhere between, and these are ballpark figures, don't quote me, anywhere between 200,000 to about four million pound each, which you think, you big farmer, get on with it. The only problem is, we have maybe 550 packaging lines globally. So it's a lot of money to suddenly come up with. And the challenge that we have is that when markets don't standardize, and I'm sure we'll talk about standards at some point, um, we have to configure the machines differently for different markets, which slows down the production time, the packaging units, OEE goes out the window, so on and so forth. So it, it's a massive challenge that comes with it, but it does give you the ability from a patient safety perspective to pick a pack up anywhere in the supply chain, scan it, and know exactly where it's been and who's had it, which is the difference between an aggregated supply chain and a point of dispense supply chain, which is what Europe is. So there are very tangible benefits, and once you've done it, you've done it. You don't have to keep going back, there's maintenance costs, you don't have to keep re-jigging the, the processes. Once it's done, it's done. Okay. So I just want to bring Eric here on, in on, first of all, the cost implication of doing that. I mean, you have the challenge of having to request multiple customers sometimes to share the cost of doing that on a line mm -hmm. or to take an upfront hit on CapEx and then charge it back through OPEX to your customers. Mm -hmm. How does it work for a CMO getting this done, getting the job done? Well, I, I think the first thing to say is that it's not easy. Uh, to manage all the customer requirements uh, uh, introduces a little bit of stretch. I think there are two dimension to dimensions to this. One is how you set up your technical solution, because obviously there are many different ways you can technically solve the problem on a manufacturing line, on a packaging line. But uh, the more flexibility you build into your packaging organization, the more complexity you will have as well, and that would also eventually drive cost. So what we have tried to do now is to really go quite hard for standardization of equipment, both when it comes to the actual serialization equipment, but also aggregation equipment. So as little variation as possible, which is uh, sometimes a challenge to, um, to convince customers that this is a good idea. Uh, when it comes to cost and, and who's going to pay this in the end, it's of course uh, not for free. And <laughs> uh, Neil uh, gave some indications about what this can cost. Um, as a CMO, we do obviously have to cover our costs. When, when we see in the industry today that there are a number of different models that companies use now, uh, actually there are CMOs saying that they will offer serialization for free. Uh, that means that they will use some of their own margins to, to offer serialization. Uh, other, other CMOs ask customers to, to pay the upfront capex and to do the investment. Can be a bit challenging if you have uh, many different customers operating in the same plant or even on the same line. I mean, who's paying for what in that scenario? And then there's a third model which we have chosen in Resi Farm, and that is a a simple fee-for-service solution where there is a transactional fee for, for every serialized pack. But I, I think it will probably still take some time before we can clearly see what CMOs will choose as the standard model for, for, for charging the costs here. Yeah, um, and I think we've, we've touched on an interesting issue around standardization and trying to predict the future as well in all of this. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe, uh, Martin, you can just give us your insights on where you see the general worldview of serialization. So GS1, 
the standards organization, for those of you who haven't come across them, uh, is very active in, in a specialist healthcare stakeholder group in promoting a single standard for use around the world for obvious reasons. It's much easier and cheaper to do uh, one framework than multi-frameworks. But for example, we still have places like China, Russia, Brazil, boiling down their traceability requirements. Um, how do you see this playing out in, in terms of, of uh, how this is going to go? Maybe, Neil, you, you're closer to the, okay. the issue on, on the topic. Um, are they going to come into line, or are, or are people going to have to be on their toes for the next five or six years just in case something comes in that's different? So part of the role that I do at work is to work with the legislators to advise on the global position because it's not a case of join our gang, you know, it's going really well, do what we're doing. It's more a case of the fact that industry is aligned to the GS1 standard set and aligned to a certain way of coating the packs, which is largely the 2D data matrix code, the chessboard code. <coughs> Excuse me. So when a market comes out and says, actually, we want to use QR codes, there, there's a strong, let's use the word strong, there's a strong response from industry to say, actually, if you just did it this way, it'd be far simpler. And it opens up your access to market because you can share packs with other markets far easier if you've got the same code and standard. Everyone uses GS1 standards, not just in pharma, manufacturing, in retail, in fast moving consumer goods, in everything. So just use it. You know, it's the best for a reason. The challenge that we have is we educate the legislators to say, use four lines of data, use a data matrix code, use tamper evidence. If you can aggregate and you've got time to wait for it, wait for it. That's great. There's still that urge within certain branches of governments to fiddle with the standards or fiddle with the requirements a little bit. It's interesting you mentioned Brazil. Brazil said from the outset that they were going to use GS1 standards and everyone celebrated that and said, that's brilliant. You know, we can do that quite easily. We won't talk about the rest of the Brazil requirements. <laughs> And then they fiddled with the serial number length and made it a mandated 13 digits when it should be anything up to 20, which set the program back, well, from a GSK perspective, 18 months. And eventually it led to that much noise that the law's been pulled in Brazil because industry was so unhappy at having such a, a regimented and um, non-flexible approach that so much noise was caused for it that eventually the law's been pulled. And we're waiting for a new version of that, that lo and behold is going to use GS1 standards. So we would always advise, use the standards, speak to industry, make it cost effective if possible, have a clear goal in mind, which should always be patient safety, always. If it's anti-counterfeiting, if it's anti-stock redirection, if it's even just the movement of goods, brilliant. But know where you're going, know how you're going to get there and work with industry to figure out how long it's going to take. So I think this touches on a broader issue, doesn't it, around management education and management buy-in, because if there's perceived uncertainty as to what the rules of the game are, then there's a tendency to stay out of the game for as long as possible. So is there enough general certainty now around the broad framework that if people are sensible and choose a flexible system, they can expand into any of the likely variations, or are we really still at a very early stage of, of not knowing what we what we don't know yet. Uh, maybe Paul, you nodding along to that. I think uh, my own view is we yeah, are I, close enough. <laughs> I think there, there's two aspects to, to that. There's the standardization, as, as Neil has alluded to, on GS1 standards, which obviously uh, simplifies the whole process from an application point of view for applying 2D matrix codes and your human readable uh, text for reading them at a pharmacy level for access to markets, etc., uh, we still do have have markets who aren't quite on on standard and configurations where it's not quite on standard. And even though the directives of the your, the falsified medicines directive would seem quite straightforward and quite prescriptive, even there there are some areas which are left slightly open to interpretation with regard to some national requirements for national health reimbursement numbers, for national trade identification numbers, which could cause areas of complexity for us and threaten the aspects of things like multi-market packs, etc., and actually could create a scenario whereby 
the outcome of the falsified medicines directive could mean that, that in difficult to reach markets, patients actually don't get access to medication because we've now put this uh, uh, requirement in there and we've added these additional requirements. So as Neil said, it, it's our position and uh, to say, okay, these are the advantages that working with GS1 can give you. These are the advantages of having a GTIN number as opposed to a national trade identification number or the sensitive aspect of PZN numbers, et cetera, in Germany, that there are significant advantages to standardization. But there's standardization on the other side too, and that is in solutions providers. Neil alluded to having equipment for aggregation, et cetera. But to apply 2D matrix and to apply this human readable text, we need technology on the lines. We need technology to verify that it's of a quality that can be read at the pharmacy level, especially for the EU FMD in the way that's uh, structured. You don't know at pharmacy level if the pharmacist has gone out and bought a scanner that was 100 euro or a scanner that was 1,000 euro. So they're going to perform very different. So your equipment online has to be able to apply and qualify the 2D matrix and the human readable text to a very high standard. On that perspective then, we've got multiple solutions providers in the market. Some of them went early and said, this is going to be ratified, we're going to be ready, we're a service provider to the pharmaceutical industry, and we're going to provide a good solution. Others waited to see whether it would get ratified, to see whether itemization level or aggregation level would be the requirement, and others waited until the directive was published and are coming to the market very late. So we, as, as uh, pharmaceutical companies implementing, were then stuck with the old system of where suppliers into us see us as a cash cow. And your solution can cost anywhere right at the minute, depending on who's providing it to you, for 250,000 up to a million euro per solution, and depending on how much complexity you build into it. Are we so talking per line there? Per line, yes. Yeah. So even within the solutions providers, even though some of these solutions providers are putting 2D matrix on, as, uh, as um, Neil alluded to, to fast-moving white goods, to things we purchase off the shelf in Tesco's, to our electronic components, 2D matrix is not new. But they see an opportunity because of the pharmaceutical industry to make some money where the, the uh, opportunity provides. And it sometimes complicates and creates very, very uh, big differences between what should be very standard solutions provided by the solutions providers. I think you raise an important point about infrastructure there as well, in that most pharmacies in the European Union um, have laser-based scanners. I yes. went into Boots 100 yards away at lunchtime, and they had a, a bleep-type laser scanner, not a camera scanner that's needed for a data matrix. Mm -hmm. So I think there's huge issues in terms of implementation. Broadband availability is another one yep. for these oh. systems. You know, there there yep. are real basic infrastructure issues. Mm -hmm. Um, it's kind of outside the scope of this discussion at the pharmacy level, so we'll park that one. But I wanted to come on to the distribution chain and the downstream of the manufacturers, uh, Martin, if I may. And, and just uh, in terms of the letter of the falsified medicines directive, you guys have got it pretty easy, right? So the manufacturers put the code on, the pharmacist checks the code, and you just whistle the stuff down in the middle. Have I understood that correctly? I, I'm, I'm joking. But, of course, the... There is no obligation for 100% verification of codes during distribution, but there are some quite thorny exceptions to that. Maybe you can just discuss what an at-risk verification is and what that sort of area is going to cause. Yeah, sure. I, I think my members would not be happy if they heard me saying that we'd got away extremely lightly, but, but certainly it's, it's better than it could have been. And I think it goes back a little bit to the discussion about aggregation. In, uh, before the adoption of the Falsified Medicines Directive, the European Commission, they're obligated to run an impact assessment to see how much these things, their, their legislative measures, will cost. And when we were replying to that consultation, the, one of the options was more or less how much a systematic verification at the level of the wholesaler would cost. In other words, how much would a track and trace solution cost for the wholesale distribution industry. And when we did our calculations, we calculated that it would be a hundredfold uh, 
more expensive to do a full track and trace solution at the level of the wholesaler than having a, a point of dispense system whereby we would adopt a risk-based approach uh, level to uh, risk-based approach to verification of products so what we have to do or will have to do is when we when we receive the products directly from the pharmaceutical industry either directly from the manufacturer or their authorized uh, wholesaler what we call a pre-wholesaler we will not carry out any verification of those products. We assume, and assume probably rightly, that they're the genuine products. So we believe that there's almost a zero risk of an infiltration of a counterfeit when we receive the products directly from the pharmaceutical industry. However, where we receive products from other wholesale distributors, for instance, we see that there is an increased risk. And there the legislation mandates us to do a systematic check, pack by pack, of the products we would receive from sources other than the pharmaceutical industry. Also, where we would receive returns, uh, it is an area, a high-risk area. There have been cases of, of falsified medicines entering into the supply chain through returns. Again, wholesalers will, will do a systematic check of each pack of those returns. And that risk-based approach is mandated by law. It's not up to the discretion of the individual wholesaler. According to our calculations, we would see about 5% of all prescription packs being checked on a systematic basis uh, when we add goods income, uh, incoming side uh, and return. So that leaves about 95% of the products where we will not need to check. And for that reason, if we go back to the discussion aggregation, we do not or have not really called uh, from our industry partners or pushed for aggregation because 95% of the products would not have to be checked pack by pack in every case. And that's something we have welcomed. And I think that's, if we want to consider getting away light from the legislation, that is how we would see it. But the legislation also, on, on the other side, when we would deliver products uh, to let's say, healthcare uh, professionals that are not working in a healthcare institutional context, then we will have to also do a, a decommissioning, what we call a decommissioning or checkout of the information in the system uh, when those products are being handed directly. And we're seeing in some countries where there is a large volume of products being held on stock by wholesalers and are being delivered directly uh, to doctors, for instance. I in Ireland, I know that there is uh, the vaccines and you, you have a huge number of products mm -hmm. which will be uh, distributed directly to a healthcare professional who is not operating in a healthcare institution context that would have that direct connection. And that's something which the national authorities can place onto the shoulders of, of the distributor. And there we are quite worried in terms of how the national authorities will interpret the language around that possibility uh, in the delegated regulation. So we may have some, some, some big effort to do I in that respect. Okay, so that could be prisons, uh, it could be veterinary medicine, there could be all sorts of outliers in that respect. Correct. But significant potentially, yeah. Um, there's just something I need to point out on the EU, sorry. The other thing that makes the European Union unique um, and the reason that a track and trace solution won't work in Europe is because parallel trade's legal within the Union. Um, and the, the Free Movement of Goods Act means that we can't use a track and trace system for Europe because we'd know from a manufacturing perspective or a generic manufacturing perspective we'd know where parallel trade was happening. Uh, we can't have access to that data. So there has to be a free platform. If you're wondering why there's the US are using everything and the EU are only using a bit part solution, that's part of the reason why. I should have pointed that out earlier, sorry. Yeah, okay. Um, just coming back to that distribution challenges then, um, are most distributors, I guess larger distributors are receiving shipper packs uh, of material back again, not just individual items from a tote pack. Are there any issues with bulk returns handling in, in terms of having to unpack boxes, check every pack, repack the box, put it back in inventory? Um, how does that look like? Yeah, I mean, c clearly that, is, that would be one of the more problematic areas. And again, that's where aggregation would indeed be, be, be a benefit. But aggregation is a double-edged sword. Uh, if we move towards aggregation, we would very much welcome that it went for goods coming from the industry or for the bulk, for the bulk uh, goods. But if we as distributors were required to do aggregation for our supplies to pharmacies, then we're into a totally different uh, area. And that's something where I think the benefit of aggregation for the, good, for the good incoming goods 
uh, it, it's far outweighing the need uh, f for or the obligation that we would have to do aggregation to pharmacy level. So uh, it, it's something we have stayed away from uh, for the moment in terms of calling from aggregation from, from, from the industry side. I know that some of our larger distributors, they do, they would like to have that, but of course it could then be the case where the legislature turns around and says, well, if you're, if you're doing aggregation, if the industry is doing aggregation for the distributor, then why does the distributor not do that for the pharmacy? And we will have batch level recording uh, of information going from distribution, uh, distrib from distributor to pharmacy, uh, but we believe that the cost would be quite prohibitive for us to do aggregation to, to, to our pharmacy customers. Okay, great. Um, just as a bit of light relief, I guess we'll quickly cover the Brexit question. Um, I did have one uh, customer say to me, well, if after Brexit, we don't need to worry about all this EU nonsense. Um, uh, which of you wants to squash that assumption flat? <laughs> Go on, Neil, you're best at these um, sort of things. Th this is my perspective, not GSK's perspective. Um, I'm thinking how to word it without sounding belligerent. Um, we will still have the, the same trade agreements, licensing and movement of goods that we have now. We will just have less say over how they're run. Is that fair? I yeah. think that's, that's the point. Um, we, we will act like, so within, within the EU platform, it's actually the EEA that are required to be included within the FMD movement. So Norway, Switzerland, Liechtenstein, Luxembourg, all of mm -hmm. these countries, plus also countries like um, Andorra, San Marino, Monaco, the Vatican, um, are also all included within scope because they have a free trade agreement with the European Union, which is what the England will have if the Brexit ever happens. If. He says, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to go there. No. <laughs> uh, okay, great. Well, let's, uh, I, I think as an international business, any drug company is not going to want to do something as an exception in the UK. So de facto, it's going to be uh, whatever rules apply. Um, maybe we can come back to the, the nuts and bolts of getting this job done then. And I'll start with Eric this time in terms of giving us an insight into what a typical project team looks like when you're serializing. It, it, Intuitively and, and kind of simplistically, you'd think it was a manufacturing problem. It's a camera, it's a, it's a printer. How hard can it be? But in real life, it's much wider than that. So maybe give us some experience. It is wider indeed. Uh, of course, manufacturing uh, people will be on a project team as well as engineering for the technical part of it. But uh, there are a lot of, of uh, processes also within the quality area that would need to be up upgraded to, to meet the new requirements, so also QA is an essential part of the organization, as well as ISIT, of course. So in order to ensure that we can embed whatever system solution we have for serialization and potentially aggregation, that it can be built into uh, our ISIT environment. But there's also a discussion whether the best solution is to have a serialization system as a standalone and that you deal with your serialization data and uh, all the data feed to the European hub and so on, independent of any ERP system, or if you uh, should take the, the different approach and try to incorporate also serialization in your ERP solution. And uh, again, I, I don't think there is one clear answer to, to that question, actually. What about the, the big pharma manufacturing environment? Is, uh, ERP is, uh, is often a, a three-letter swear word in, in these situations, but uh, is there a, a management strong view either way, or is it something that may evolve over time, but it's not something you're going to do from the start? I think, again, there's no, it, it's one of those situations where there's no one-size-fits-all. I think SAP were one of those providers who came to the, the table very late in the day with an, an SAP ERP solution that could handle serialization data management. So some of the other solutions providers are far more advanced uh, in that field and can handle data management. But the, as Neil has said a couple of times, there's a uniqueness associated with the European Falsified Medicines Directive. We're, uh, mo all companies now are serializing for South Korea, Turkey, etc. for example. 
These are all sequentially generated serial numbers. Within the European falsified medicines records, there's another uniqueness for randomization. And some of the systems that are there at the minute cannot handle randomization. There are a number of solutions providers that give you that opportunity. They have reporting tools, etc. And it, that is a much better solution for generating your original unique identifiers. So now, if, if we have a CMO operating for us, such as Resifarm, the onus is not on Resifarm to upload the data to the European hub. The onus is on Shire as the MA holder to upload the data. So we need to decide how we supply Resifarm the data. Do we supply them a G10 number and let Resifarm generate serial numbers? Then they need to have the randomization capability. Or do we supply banks of unique identifiers to uh, Resifarm that are already randomized and they can just select from that and print as we place orders on them for products. You then have the, the complexity of the issues we talked about earlier and they've been uh, discussed numerous times during the day today, the whole area of data management and trust. There's a, a seismic shift with regard to the pharmaceutical industry here now in engaging with the European hub setup and the EMBO because we've got to trust them in how they manage our data. We have very specific requirements on how to set up our master data in the hub. So we're transferring a significant level of product knowledge into a virtual database that we now have to trust a third party to manage for us and to guarantee the integrity of that. So we have the same issues with trusting of, of data and data generated that we're hearing that patients have with the pharmaceutical industry and their data. So that concern is, is throughout the industry and it's, it's throughout the uh, whole process with regard to serialization, where the data goes, how they match up the serial numbers to your particular product, how they manage and hold on to your master data with regard to that product and the safety and security of all that. Because no matter how many times we engage with EMBO or EFPIA, and the uh, national associations engage with it and each one has maybe a different requirement of what they want to do with the data. The one message is that when the MA holder transfers the data to the EU hub, it's no longer their data. Okay? It belongs in the supply chain and it will be used to verify the pack at the point of dispense. Yeah, interesting point and I'm glad you brought up master data. Um, I'm gonna take your question first and then if it covers, uh, if it doesn't cover what I'm gonna say, then I'll, I'll say my point. Thanks. Just listening to the debate, and it may not really be a question for you, but technology and security attracts a villainous R&D itself. So when we think about serialization, do you think we're going to be facing hackers and the rest of it, and how would we stay ahead with all of that? Good question. I think from um, our perspective, with, just like with the setup of the national hubs, the European hub has been set up by what we call the EMBO, the European Medicines Verification uh, Organization. They've gone through a very prescriptive process in selecting the solutions provider for the European hub, which will manage the data. As part of, of us then integrating with that hub, we have to go through a very prescriptive process whereby we're validated by the EMBO to ensure that we're not somebody who could potentially supply falsified medicines uh, into this, the system. So we have to verify that we are Shire, and as a representative of, of Shire, I can sign off the non-disclosure agreements, the confidentiality agreements, etc. With regard to the hub itself, we have to trust from, and the user requirement spec for it now is, is seven volumes, it would stack, this high and more on the, on the table, we've got a trust from that and our engagement with the EMBO that it has been set up with <coughs> the maximum level of, of security to safeguard our data and to safeguard our opportunities. Does that mean that it will be free from hacking? Uh, we will be grossly underestimating the ability of, of hackers and the moral fiber of hackers to sit down and do what they do 
on a daily basis to understand that we will get a waiver for the lifetime of, of this process. But it, it has been made as secure as is feasibly possible in the current environment. I think that's a great question generally for smaller companies particularly. Um, counterfeiters are probably not going to try and hack into that seven volume URS defined system. They're probably going to pay a guy in a production plant somewhere to tell them or, or give them a memory stick of the data that was made that day and then be quicker than pharma is at getting their product to marketplace because they don't have the eight month lag time that we do. So it's really important to get your people processes and your business processes aligned with all of this fancy high tech digital security. Uh, otherwise it's pointless. Um, there's no use having a great big high fence if you leave the gate open. So um, great question. I wanna come back to this thing about master data. And again, this is uh, any small manufacturers in the room, any specialty pharma, you class yourself as a, as a smallish company, um, none in here. So one of the things that we've found is that even just describing your product lines, your stock keeping units in terms of global trade item numbers, converting your stock to GTIN frameworks is a hard task for some companies. It's an, it's an underestimated problem. Um, maybe one of you guys can just give an insight into how much work has gone into master data cleaning and getting ready to even upload that information that you mentioned. Um, Neil, you're, not, you're shaking your head, so feel free to weigh in. GSK have a, a really awesome history with data. Um, it's, it's not the absence of data that's the problem um, for us, it's the abundance of data um, in multiple databases, in multiple systems normally. Um, the problem with being a mergers and acquisitions company is that when companies are procured, their systems don't match our systems, and then they're never data mashed. So the EU seems to be the running theme. So just on that, we've got countries that don't even have barcodes at the moment. So they're currently identified within our systems by an EAN number. EAN was the forerunner to what's now GS1, um, the European Article Association. Um, <coughs> they're not transferable. Um, in that you can't take an EN code and print it into a barcode and put it on a pack because it doesn't match up with the current standards. The other challenge that we had, and it's something Paul mentioned earlier on, is that different country standards don't match with other country standards. So the German system and the Austrian system are both called PZN, but you can't share them together because they conflict with each other from a data management perspective, and then the whole thing goes wrong. So we have varying degrees of, we have some markets that have nothing, some markets that have far too much, like the US, for instance, um, we have some markets that have required a, a massive effort in terms of collecting data, finding out uh, nomenclatures, common names, description of product even. Um, even the size of the pack has proved a challenge at times. And then standardizing those across the board could keep me busy until I retire. Um, so at the moment, we're focusing purely on what's first and then working down the queue as we go from there. I would love to pay <coughs> a thousand people to come in and fix it but it's, it's just not likely to happen, sadly. So it's, it's a massive challenge. And the fact that it has to happen before you can actually change your packaging or do any of your artwork changes is slightly terrifying. When markets come out and legislate, they want full track and trace within six months. And you think, well, we don't even know what numbers are on the boxes at the moment. So, yeah, we have to, we have to manage the expectations of the stakeholders on it. Yeah, I, I actually think that the uh, forthcoming artwork changes might be an underestimated challenge in, in the industry. Do you want to explain just a little bit about what that is, briefly? Uh, yeah, I mean, basically all uh, uh, product cartons will, will need to have an artwork change in order to fit the, the, the codes for the serialization codes. Um, maybe there are exceptions, but generally speaking, all packages will need, need a change. And uh, at least in our organization, we have uh, quite a heavy workload in doing just the normal artwork changes <coughs> that happen all the time due to different changes in markets uh, and with the customers, etc. But now we've, we have a situation coming in the next two years when everything needs to change. And I think this will require a lot of resource in organizations. Yeah, and just to echo Eric's point where um, we've been looking at phasing the uh, artwork changes. But in discussions with our artwork team in the, the last couple of weeks, what I've identified is that for very good reasons, 
they have been driving all our various markets right, to have pre-printed prompts for printing on the cartons. So we've pre-printed lot and expiry and whatever configurations are required by whatever market and whatever language. But that prevents you, if that's your process, from a phased implementation. Because all of a sudden now, do I need to have pre-printed prompts for GTIN number, for serial number, as well as lot and expiry? And how can I put them on the carton if I'm not applying a 2D matrix and the unique identifier? So we've created challenges within our own environment that could help us to phase in the, this process. And we may be looking at, for a huge number of markets, a big bang implementation, which is much, much uh, more difficult mm -hmm. to manage in that environment. I just, in the last three or four minutes, want to move on to potential new business models and benefits of this cost that we're all incurring. Um, and it, we read the literature and there's all sorts of things from bedside safety of patients because the drug is uniquely identifiable. Um, there are things, you know, you, you see stuff that Amazon's going to take over drug distribution because they have uh, the logistics model and we don't need all the bits in the middle anymore. Um, so maybe on that note, I'll, I'll start at the far end with Martin. <laughs> is this going to change the way distributors do business or is this just a thing, another, another technique? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think we said at the beginning that we have um, more or less all stakeholders, uh, supply chain operators, have two, have, will have soon less than two years uh, to get ready for what's coming. And from our perspective, we see that there is a need really to focus on the objective of the legislation. There are some very strict and, 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 and high-level um, requirements coming in the legislation. We need to get ready for serialization. We need to have the systems in places. We need to be able to do that. That's, that's one thing, an issue of compliance. Otherwise, we'll have po products on the market which should not be on the market. And we, ha we are hearing a lot of discussions about efficiencies which may come from uh, once we have this uh, system implemented. But from our perspective, w our message to our members is focus, focus on what needs to be done now. And we can start to have the discussion about what can be done later or uses of the system new business models for that, return on investment. We hear a lot about, about that, but we must focus, and I think this is going to be the key, is to get ready, just get ready to comply first. Yeah. What about the big company perspective? Is it perceived as just a burden, or is there a, a shining light at the end of this tunnel? I think, using both the GSK hat and the patient hat, um, from a GSK perspective, there are a lot of benefits, it, from standardization, from movement of goods, from anti-counterfeiting benefit from the patient safety angle as well. Um, it's where the tilting point is, I suppose, between we're doing it because we have to do it, because it's legislated and we can't sell packs if we don't do it, to where we're out in front and we've got that many packaging lines of critical mass now that we can choose markets to do it. So part of um, the irony within Europe is that Italy go last, and yet Italy poses the biggest counterfeit problem. So there's no, you can actually compare the two maps. If you take the global anti-counterfeiting map and the global serialization map and lay them on top of each other, there's absolutely no correlation whatsoever. Um, I think we'll get to a stage where we are out in front of the legislation and we have the ability to start approaching governments to say, we have anti-counterfeiting issues, we know that there's a lot of bulk product, you know, low, uh, low cost, high volume products that are fake coming out of your region. Serialization may be the answer and we can achieve it for you within X amount of years using this infrastructure in the market and it will gain you these benefits. But I think we're away from that at the moment. I think from a patient perspective, definitely. I think the fact that the thing that I've got in my hand now has a unique identifier on it that's standardized with a global standard and Mark knows me from a way back, but <coughs> to then use that in the NHS with your wristband to say this patient took that at this time during this procedure means that you've then got a documented power of attorney care cycle throughout the entire patient journey. So you could then essentially get to the end of a patient journey and print off everything that's happened within that. But the enabler to that is doing it up front, yeah. be it pharmaceuticals, be it medical devices, be it anything. And we're now at the cresting point, I suppose, where we're starting to mark packs to enable that to happen five, 10, 15 years on. Great. Um, 
great to finish on an up note as well. Good on, good on you for that. Um, any last questions before we close for coffee? These guys, like I said, are a valuable resource. So uh, if you didn't want to stick your hand up in public, feel free to badger them over a cup of tea. Um, I think in the meantime, though, uh, we should thank our panelists for a great session. Thank you. Thank you.